Hello, and welcome to the Week 4 Supplemental Lecture on Paul Feyerabend's How to Defend Society Against Science. Now, most of the people we're reading this week, even if they regard themselves as critical in some sense of science and technology, also claim to speak in the name of a certain spirit of science. They are aligned in some sense with its ideals, and what they're worried about is its authoritarian character, its dominant position in society, or some of the ways that it deviates from its own ideals. Feyerabend has a much more radical critique. He is an anarchist of a particular kind and is aiming for a maximal increase of multiplicity within society and a decentralization of authority. And science is what he regards is as a central authority in our society, something that needs to be taken down many, many notches. So in some of the things we're going to look at next week, where people are really going after critics of science, saying that they're weakening the rationale for the whole field, Feyerabend is one of the people that they can find the clearest proof texts for the sorts of things that they think is, are wrong with people who are critical of science overall. So this is an extremely provocative piece. It's not that difficult to read. In this lecture, I'll talk a little bit, uh, I'll un unpack some of the references he makes. But most of it you can probably follow without much assistance. But it is a hugely provocative piece. And it starts off sort of insulting the people who've brought him out for this talk and have paid his way and are presumably expecting some sort of um, imparting of, of knowledge of a particular kind. And he's, he gives this extremely <laughs> deflationary sort of crass explanation of how he developed his position, uh, which basically goes, well, somebody was going to pay me to write something for a book, so sure, I wanted the money, I got paid. Then someone was willing to pay my flights to come overseas, so sure, I'll, I'll come over and talk about this. And then you guys invited me here too, and hey, it's sort of less work, and I think it's still defensible to give the same talk that other people paid me to do, so I'm going to give that talk to you as well. So um, it's not, uh, it doesn't mean his audience would have received the talk badly at all. Sometimes people like being abused in this particular way by speakers. Um, but it is certainly not an emollient approach. It is very confrontational. And what he says is he speaks before very diverse audiences, and he's got in mind the place where this talk's being delivered and one he'd given immediately prior, that he says are characterized by huge class differences and also political differences. He regards the previous audience as being right-wing and wealthy and his current audience as being left-wing and not so wealthy. But he says, you both share a common respect for science. You want to reform it and make it less authoritarian, but you accept that it's a valuable source of knowledge and it needs to be kept sort of separate and distinct and precious in various ways. And you also think that knowledge is a very serious thing. That's not what he's going to do. So he's not going to confirm these assumptions. What he's going to do is to say that we need to find ways of defending society from science. He says you have to see science as an ideology, and he specifically equates it with a fairy tale, and says that like a fairy tale, you shouldn't take it too seriously. He says one must read them like fairy tales, which have lots of interesting things to say, but which also contain wicked lies, or like ethical prescriptions, which may be useful rules of thumb, but which are deadly when followed to the letter. Okay, so there's something to it. It's an organizing principle. It gives us some ideas. It has some power, but it has a lot of nonsense in it as well. And he's going to talk about science in that light. He says that there are these images of science that date back to the Enlightenment period, where it's understood as a champion against superstition, as being very anti-authoritarian, as liberating, as granting people intellectual freedom, as being this real champion of human development. And he talks through, he goes through a series of radical critics who are willing at base to fundamentally change the structures and institutions of society. But he says, strangely, all of them want to keep science. Okay, so nobody's trying to call into question this institution. And he says, well, how do we evaluate this? Are all of these radical critics just fooled? And he says, yes and no. So in the 17th and 18th centuries, he believes, science genuinely was an instrument of liberation. It made people question their inherited beliefs. But science today is quite different. It is our inherited belief. So scientific facts are taught in schools the way religious facts used to be. It's largely exempted, Feyerabend thinks, from criticism in the public sphere. So he thinks it is the dominant 
way of thinking, the dominant thing to believe in. And as such, you can't view it as a force of liberation. Now, he says, a truth that reigns without checks and balances is a tyrant who must be overthrown. And any falsehood that can aid us in the overthrow of this tyrant is to be welcomed. This is quite interesting. Any falsehood that can aid us in the overthrow of this tyrant. So he's not saying we're going to come up with something more true and we're going to say science has falsified it. He's happy to go with the lies. He just wants something to reduce the power of this entity. Okay, very confrontational, very blunt. It's a little different from Mary Midgley this week, who will also talk about science as incorporating myths, but is talking about correcting its excesses and correcting sort of bastardizations of it as a form of thought. Feyerabend's got a, a quite a bit more radical position. And then he runs through, and this is a bit like the Bloor reading from this week, he runs through a series of hypothetical objections to what he's trying to do, things that he expects people are going to say. And he says, so one of the objections people might pose to what I'm saying is that science has discovered truth. So sure, it was revolutionary and exploding old ideas at the point that the old ideas were false. But when you discover truth, there's no point to continue going on and exploding things. It's not going to have that original kind of liberatory aspect. In that sense, it discovers the truth, and once you discover it, you stick with the truth, surely. And he says, well, truth sounds neutral, but the term is easily used to justify ideology. And then he raises a point, and this is something that Weber also mentions, and it is, of course, not true that we have to follow the truth. Human life is guided by many ideas. Truth is one of them. Freedom and mental independence are others. If truth, as conceived by some ideologists, conflicts with freedom, then we have a choice. We may abandon freedom, but we may also abandon truth. And he says, my criticism of modern science is that it inhibits freedom of thought. If the reason is that it has found the truth and now follows it, then I would say that there are better things than first finding and then following such a monster. Okay, very provocative. He's willing to sacrifice truth in exchange for greater multiplicity, greater freedom, greater uh, sort of diversity of belief systems within society. Okay. And he's got a section titled Against Method. He also has a book called Against Method. So if people want to write on him or dig more deeply into what he's doing, you can take a look at this. So he thinks about another possible objection to his position here. The objection is that science has found a very productive method and that the results and successes of that method prove the validity of the method. And he says, look, there's a huge methodological literature. It's very sophisticated. Lots of people criticize the idea of the scientific method or what it's achieved. The problem with these sophisticated critiques is that he doesn't think any of them quite articulate what's wrong with his attempt to defend science based on its method. And so he says, and again, very provocatively, when sophistication loses content, then the only way of keeping in touch with reality is to be crude and superficial. And that is what I intend to be. Okay, so he says there are problems with the claim that science has a method with which it can be identified, and this is something he'll explore in greater depth in his book. He, in the book, goes through essentially arguing that the conception of the scientific method doesn't really apply very well to the actual ways in which really, really important scientific insights are realized, are thought up and implemented and developed experimentally. He says, these ideas that science can be equated with a method assume for the mind what they want to explain for the world, that it works in a regular fashion. Okay. So there's an assumption in the notion of the scientific method that the way that we think is methodical. He doesn't think that it usually is. And then he refers to a particular understanding of science, and it's one that if you read the Popper this week, you will have run into there. It's somewhat in the Palanyi as well. The claim that better theories are more comprehensive, okay, and that you can favor a theory, even if you're not sure if the theory is right, by how, it, how well it competes with other theories, by how it compares with other theories. And he sort of, he characterizes this position. And this is not an unfair characterization of Popper in particular. Uh, the theory we have chosen may be pretty lousy, 
It may contain contradictions, it may conflict with well-known facts, it may be cumbersome, unclear, ad hoc and decisive places, and so on, but it may still be better than any other theory that is available at the time. It may in fact be the best lousy theory that there is. Okay. And he says, under this sort of competitive notion of how science works, old theories sort of hang around as, as potential correctives and comparisons and kind of stories about where we've gone wrong. And there's also a notion that standards of judgment compete with each other and change over time as well, and that they also get improved, and yet we retain a historical memory of all the ones that were competed out. And he says, this competitive vision of what science is and how it works is associated with both Popper and Mill, and he has in mind the Mill from the selection that we read last week. But the two authors, he says, have very, very different aims with quite different implications for the sorts of science they authorize. So he says, Popper is mainly interested in the epistemological question. So Popper is interested in the question of how we know what we think we know. He works out a pure logical expression of his theory, okay, and works it out in his head rather than going out and observing what scientists actually do. He tries to establish rigid, fixed standards that can be unambiguously stated. So those of you who read the Popper this week will know he's interested in clear demarcation criteria that can differentiate science from pseudoscience or non-science. And then he's quite happy to eject certain forms of knowing from the category of science at all. Fairbairn says Mill is a bit different. He is interested in, and what develops his theory of science, is an interest in the development of the human potential. He tries to take his theory of what science is by looking at what happens in actual practice. Okay, so he arrives at a similar sort of notion that more comprehensive theories might be better than less comprehensive theories, but it's coming from a different place from Popper's. And he explicitly understands the standards that we use to judge theories as historically grounded and changeable. Fairbairn says, Popper's approach would be an advantage if science itself were clear, unambiguous, and precisely formulated. Fortunately, it is not. Okay, so Fairbairn likes the idea of the messiness of the scientific process, but doesn't think the scientific self-understanding or some of the theories of how it works are adequate to that. And then he moves into a couple of people whose work he thinks provides a basis for a critique of Popper. He's not going to particularly like either of them. He's going to sort of try to move beyond both. Um, he talks initially about Kuhn, and he's quite scathing of Kuhn. Um, but he's nevertheless going to pick up the idea of revolutionary science which is a, a central idea for Kuhn. So you have these periods for Kuhn, for those of you who didn't read him, where science operates under a set of sort of shared consensus notions of what the important problems are. And then you have revolutionary periods where those paradigms, those consensus frameworks change, and you get the sort of rapid advance of a new kind of way of working. And Feyerabend says, many revolutionary ideas are unfalsifiable every moderately interesting theory is falsified. Moreover, theories have formal flaws. Many of them contain contradictions, ad hoc adjustments, and so on and so forth. Applied resolutely, Popperian criteria would eliminate science without replacing it by anything comparable. They're useless as an aid to science. Okay, so he thinks Popper's got a definition that demarcates science from pseudoscience, and yet when you try to apply the definition, everything we do, no matter how scientific it superficially looks, is actually going to fail the criterion and move into the pseudoscience category. And he says that Kuhn provides a basis for trying to think about this critically, but he's much too vague. And you know, this is sort of super scathing. Kuhn encourages people who have no idea why a stone falls to the ground to talk with assurance about scientific method. Now, I have no objection to incompetence. Okay, so, and we'll see as we go further this, Feyerbahn means this in a, in a very serious way. But I do object when incompetence is accompanied by boredom and self-righteousness, and this is exactly what happens. We do not get interesting false ideas, we get boring ideas or words connected with no ideas at all. So he's quite happy with interesting false ideas. Wherever one tries to make Kuhn's ideas more definite, one finds that they're false. Was there ever a period of normal science in the history of thought? No, 
and I challenge anyone to prove the contrary. Okay, so normal science is meant to be for Kuhn this period where people share enough assumptions that they can sort of keep working forward in a research program, and Feyerbahn doesn't think that it works that way. And then he talks about Lakatos, who's a figure that we're not reading for this term, but is another one of these sort of major theorists that's trying to thematize scientific method from a slightly critical perspective. And Feyerbahn says, Lakatos emphasizes research programs rather than individual theories, and is interested in sort of sequences of related theories that show a kind of tendency over time in what they're pointing at. So individual theories can be discarded, but you can discern a sort of a program that continually generates new predictions that keep driving things. And Feyerbahn says, Lakatos offers words which sound like elements of a methodology. He does not offer a methodology. And then he concludes, there is no method according to the most advanced and sophisticated methodology in existence today. So complementary of Lakatos thinks he's gone as far as you can go in trying to show that there's some sort of method. And what he actually shows is that there's no such thing, Farabin thinks. And then he's got a section called Against Results. Okay, and again, he's trying to anticipate possible objections to what he's saying. In this case, it's someone asking whether science doesn't deserve some special position in society because of its results. And Feyerabend says, look, this question only makes sense if you assume that nothing else can generate results. Maybe other methods could produce results. And he says it's actually kind of hard to tell because science is so dominant that it's sort of squeezed out everything else. And then he comes in with an incredible statement, and this is one of these sorts of things that if you, if you don't like critical studies of science, you go straight for stuff like this uh, as uh, to exemplify the sort of the collapse of values that people fear are going to happen if people start thinking critically about science. So he says, we've become acquainted with methods of medical diagnosis and therapy which are effective, perhaps even more effective than the corresponding parts of Western medicine, and which are yet based on an ideology that is radically different from the ideology of Western science. We've learned that there are phenomena such as telepathy and telekinesis, which are obliterated by a scientific approach, and which could be used to do research in an entirely novel way. Okay, so these are sort of positions that people will hold. There are scientific research programs on these sorts of things. So he still sounds here as though he's in the space of saying, look, there are competing sorts of things that uh, kind of exist in a realm where we can test them. And it looks like he might be occupying that space. But then in the same paragraph, in the same section, he says, and is it not the case that the church saved souls while science often does the very opposite? Of course, nobody now believes in the ontology that underlies that judgment. Why? Because of ideological pressures identical with those which today make us listen to science to the exclusion of everything else. Okay. That last claim doesn't fall into anything that looks like a testable proposition. He is making a strong assertion that he wants a multiplicity of quite different ideas in play to reduce the domination, to compete with science for social attention and social prestige and authority. He notes that ideas external to science can be incorporated into it eventually if they prove themselves on its terms. But he notes that science suppresses these ideals initially. It initially has a conservative element to it. And again, this is something that will be conceded and even talked about as a virtue in readings like the Polanyi from this week. He says, science has done many things, but so have other ideologies. Science is just one of many ideologies that propel society, and it should be treated as such. Okay, so no hierarchy of systems of knowledge here, a flat, relativistic notion of the value of what different ideologies and what different forms of thought, all treated as ideologies, might possibly contribute. And again, this is one of the things that people will go straight for uh, and assume is behind all kinds of critical studies of science, whether the particular critics are trying to distance themselves from this kind of position or not. And Kuhn fights endlessly to keep himself from being lumped in with, with this particular approach in particular. And Feyerabend recommends the separation of state and science, like we have the separation of church and the state. He says, power must reside with democratically elected bodies, 
Scientists are just one voice among many that shouldn't have any privileged access. You don't want a kind of technocratic battalion of scientists that have some special role in advising the state on policy. And then a couple of super controversial statements, and he knows that they are. Considering the sizable chauvinism of the scientific establishment, we can say, the more Lysenko affairs, the better. Okay, now this may have fallen out of historical memory for many of the people who take the course. It's something you might want to take a look at on Wikipedia. It will probably come up in other readings. This is a situation where someone who's essentially a charlatan gets quite a high position in Stalinist uh, Russia based on Lamarckian genetic theory. So he has an idea that, that organisms can pass along acquired traits, traits that they develop during their la lifetimes can be passed along to their offspring. So it's an anti-Darwinian uh, notion of evolution. And he was claiming that he could improve agricultural yields as well, and this is in a period where they desperately needed to be improved. People's lives were dependent on it. And it becomes the official science. Um, Mendelian genetics, the sort of uh, Darwinistic theories that we're more familiar with genetically, uh, are banned. They're regarded as bourgeois. They're based on competition. Uh, they look capitalist in their origin. And this becomes an official ideology. And the name is often used as a shorthand for bad state intervention that dictates what truth is going to be rather than letting science battle it out and work it out through scientific methods. So it's extremely controversial. Uh, for Feyerabend to say this, and not least because a number of Russian geneticists who would have been working in a Mendelian framework and who would have endorsed more Darwinian notions of evolution get killed. Okay, so it's not just the state saying, here's our preferred theory, it is a murderous action. And he says, it's not the interference of the state that is objectionable in the case of Lysenko, but the totalitarian interference which kills the opponent rather than just neglecting his advice. Okay, so he's not, he's not endorsing all forms of state interference, but he's using this example, which is the flashpoint example that will come up again and again for, for what's wrong with not letting science follow its own course. And then he says in something that's a bit more familiar to us in a contemporary context, three cheers to the fundamentalists in California who succeeded in having a dogmatic formulation of the theory of evolution removed from the textbooks and an account of Genesis included. Well, I know they would become as chauvinistic and totalitarian as scientists are today when given the chance to run society all by themselves. Ideologies are marvelous when used in the companies of other ideologies. They become boring and doctrinaire as soon as their merits lead to the removal of their opponents. But because he regards science as in the ascendance, he likes the religious contestation, the successful religious contestation, that gets a particular religious viewpoint institutionalized in the textbooks. And then he turns to education. Okay, so what sort of education supports the kind of society he's trying to bring about? He says, look, when you think about what education does, it tries to orient our young to society and to nature, to the world they're going to have to live in socially and naturally. And it does it initially by means of basic myths, which can then be refined through later training and initiation ceremonies and things like this. And he cites a few examples that he claims indicate that there were approaches in past societies that tried to reduce the power of any individual myth, both by multiplying the myths that were available and criticizing all of them. He says, by contrast, we don't try to do that. Instead, we try to inculcate belief and acceptance of our dominant myth, which he thinks is science. And he thinks this becomes harmful if there's only one myth. Okay. He doesn't think that in this day and age, we have to worry about this with religion, because he says there's no way to prevent students from coming into contact with some other religious system. Whereas with science, he thinks it is so dominant that there isn't an alternate voice, and students are not likely to come into anything that yields any kind of critical purchase or kickback against science. He says, what we need here is an education that makes people contrary, counter-suggestive, without making them incapable of devoting themselves to the elaboration of any single view. 
So he's okay with someone deciding to devote themselves to science. He's not okay with people not realizing there's no choice in that matter, that there might be other worldviews, other theories, other ideologies to which they could equally devote themselves. And he wants lots of different things to which people are devoting themselves across society. And so he wants an anti-dogmatic education. He wants children exposed to stories and then to reasons and then to contrary reasons so that you've got a vast array of perspectives they're presented with that they can sort out on their own and make up their own minds about. Both reasons and contrary reasons, he says, will be told by the experts in the fields. And so the young generation becomes acquainted with all kinds of sermons and all types of wayfarers. It becomes acquainted with their stories, and every individual can make up his mind which way to go. Okay, so science is in amongst the scrum, it's in amongst the mix, it is also treated as something preaching a sermon, as a wayfarer drifting through, standing up on a soapbox and putting forward the view, which has to compete with all sorts of other views, and then the kids can sort it out for themselves individually. And then he runs through a set of objections to this kind of education. And he says, some people will worry that we won't have enough scientists if this happens. But he says, no, no, people will still become scientists because it's very lucrative. You make money, you can get prestige. The difference is that when they become scientists, they won't have absorbed scientific ideology. And he says they will have made a free choice. Then the objection that if we do it this way and if people make up their own minds and come to science late, they're not going to be very competent at it. And he says, no, no, it won't reduce the competence because science relies on creativity. And because they won't be ideologically indoctrinated into it, they will be far more creative scientists than what we have now. He says it will also make science a more attractive area to work in because it will be more creative, more energetic, more uh, diverse than what it currently is. And then he says, of course, scientists will not play any predominant role in the society I envisage. They will be more than balanced by magicians, or priests, or astrologers. And then he says, people are afraid that this will undermine the truth. But he says, it's only a historical accident that we assume that truth relies on science. Okay, and again, it's a real sort of red rag to the bull. This, uh, this really draws uh, fire. And then he gets to what he says is the most important possible objection to the position he's putting forward, which is, isn't it irresponsible to assert the importance of something like freedom of thought when people are suffering in ways that can only be relieved by science and by scientific insight and by further scientific discovery? And he says, look, this is an important objection. This is worth thinking about, whereas it's not clear whether he thinks the other objections are really worth taking all that seriously. But he says that this objection assumes that you don't need freedom of thought in order to relieve that suffering, that science doesn't need freedom of thought in order to discover whatever it can be most useful at doing. He says it also assumes we can't pursue both goals at once, that there's some kind of zero-sum game that means that we can either have freedom of thought or we can have material success through science. And he says even if it slows us down, even if pursuing both at once makes progress sort of a little bit slower than it would have been, it'll at least prevent us from thinking that we've liberated people when actually we've just introduced them to some new form of unfreedom that then we're going to have to deal with. He says it also assumes we know what to do that we know how to relieve suffering. And in particular, he's interested in whether the people we're trying to save might want some other kind of intervention than the kind of intervention we're trying to provide. And then he says, why would anyone want to liberate anyone else? Surely not because of some abstract advantage of liberty, but because liberty is the best way to free development and thus to happiness. We want to liberate people so that they can smile. Shall we be able to do this if we ourselves have forgotten how to smile and are frowning on those who still remember? The hardest task needs the lightest hand, or else its completion will not lead to freedom, but to a tyranny much worse than the one it replaces. Okay, so the question as we move forward through other readings this week and next week is, how well this sits based on some of the history that's happened in the intervening decades. We'll talk about that in class.